Hi there. Uh, my name is Damien Eng. Uh, I'm going to talk about building a community-driven open source program in a healthcare company. Uh, by the way, in case you wonder why I put the word ingestion at the end, it's because when I uh, submitted the talk, I think I, lot, I have a lot more time. So then I realized I only have like 25 minutes, so I'll just focus on one part of our open source program. All right, so a um, little bit about uh, me and who the heck is talking. Uh, so I'm the head of architecture for Express Scripts. I'm going to talk about a company in the next slide. My primary job is that I run kind of platform strategy, uh, build targets architecture, and also lead a lot of the technical innovation. Um, I have built and led the open source program in our company for the last uh, three and a half-ish years. Uh, I live in St. Louis, and uh, my moonlighting job is that I organize pickup soccer for my company as well in St. Louis. So anyone like soccer here, by the way, watch? Anyone recognize the, the team jersey? Uh, it's England, and uh, for any of you who follow uh, British football, soccer, they score like 11 goals in two games. So uh, proud at least like put the jersey here. Uh, so Express Scripts, uh, we are a Fortune 22 organization uh, until beginning, uh, until the end of last year when we become part of the Signal family. So what do we do? Uh, we are primarily the, the uh, one of the country's largest uh, PBM, the Pharmacy Benefit Management Company. So imagine if you go to uh, any of, of your pharmacy uh, with a script by your doctor, you want to get your medication. Then the, the pharmacist will, pro will probably do this, uh, get your prescription card and start typing a bunch of stuff. At that time, they're actually talking to our systems. So in a certain way, we are uh, looking at it as a, a medical transaction system. Uh, we are also one of um, the country's largest home delivery pharmacies, and we serve more than a million people, 100 million people. So, so much about uh, the company. So, uh, let's go talk about the background. So, how many of you are in Fortune 200-ish company? Fortune 500-ish company? All right, so uh, let me try it. How many of you actually outsource significant amount of your IT? to whoever favorite company out there. Very cool. Uh, not many of them, so I'll, then that may uh, be, a, be an, an interesting perspective. So our legacy is that similar to any Fortune 100 company, we outsource significant amount of our development effort to the favorite vendors. Uh, what it means is that a lot of both exploration and adoption of any open source technology actually being outsourced as well. So our vendor are responsible for doing a lot of them. And most of the time, we don't necessarily need to be too concerned about uh, any kind of legal rights or right of use of open source technology because our contractual agreement with our vendors usually cover that. Now, if our, some of our engineers actually want to use and ingest open source technology, we have the ivory tower organization that's responsible for ad hoc approval. So you can probably imagine that it's not very efficient, but it's also because we don't have the need to do that. Because if you outsource majority of your IT, then you, you won't have many use cases to do open source technology. So we don't need to build an open source program. Up until uh, 2016 is that um, same for a lot of large organizations, my company went through a technology transformation program. So we want to refocus ourselves uh, on innovation, uh, we believe that technology is an edge uh, in our business. Uh, instead of IT being supporting the business, we believe that technology is an edge for our business. So we almost like, we jumpstart uh, our technology innovation initiative and we begin to hire a lot more engineers and focus on innovation. Guess what, right? Uh, we begin to look at leveraging open source technology as uh, a, a key uh, indication, a key avenue to do so. But of course, uh, and then we realized that, geez, we don't actually have an open source program to streamline that. We can always do ad hoc approval for everything, uh, but everything will be painfully slow. So 
we begin the journey to build a program. So if you look at a priority, uh, every company's uh, open source program usually have these three things. So this is nothing like new to all of you, right? You need to figure out how to use efficiency in just new technology into your organization. You need to figure out that how do you handle a lot of the rights of use and copyright things to, in order to contribute to open source. Uh, trust me, in a healthcare organization, contributing your IP or your code uh, to GitHub is actually a lot um, more complicated than you imagine. But I'm not going to talk about it today. Uh, and obviously, we will talk about uh, uh, in the sourcing as well. So today, we focus mainly on the ingestion. Uh, Next time, if we got an opportunity talking, I will talk about other stuff. All right. So any, any open source ingestion program always is a balance between conflicting needs, right? Uh, we want to minimize our legal risk being if we adopt a specific technology using the wrong license, it may actually expose our IP. Uh, we want to also measure technology footprint. I'm going to focus on that a little bit. Being, uh, if you say, hey, we adopt and embrace open source, does it mean that every tech lead can use their favorite uh, technology to solve the same problem? Probably not. Uh, we want to obviously encourage innovation. Uh, security and compliance are also important, but we also need to make sure that it is scalable for a Fortune 25 organization because uh, we have thousands and thousands of technology employees. So we cannot have, let's say, a single team to approve everything. It just won't scale, and it will uh, be very disruptive for our engineers. So uh, what do we want to focus on? So initially, if you hear a lot of keynotes this morning, they're like, a lot of open source adoption is really, really about bottom up. So what we try to do is we try to remove as many hurdles uh, to make a decentralized, scalable program as possible. So instead of focusing on the technical aspect of it, the first thing we do is that we focus on the legal policy. If you have a legal policy that is commonly understood and be able to get executed in a federated manner, things will get a lot easier. So um, guiding principle for building a legal policy. We want to encourage uh, exploring technology as much as possible. We want to care and review only high-risk area, and I'm going to talk about what are the high-risk area later. Uh, one thing that is takes time to convince our legal and compliant partners that you don't necessarily need to be 100% compliant because from 90 to 100 is the most effort, right? So a lot of times you want to be compliant, but if you need to get into 100% compliant, then it becomes a diminishing return of effort. Uh, the most important thing is that we want to be in a self-governance mode as much as possible. Being uh, the, the intent between technology and legal at the time is that we don't want to suddenly expand to a team of 100 legal, uh, 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 legal team or 100 people architecture team just to do like open source governance. So we want to focus as much as clear documentation and clear guidelines so that we can do self-governance. By the way, I'm trying to like bounce between here and there, so that's kind of fun. Um, so immediate challenge. Um, there are way too many licenses out there. Each of them will have their different, uh, different definition. Uh, what we also find out soon is that legal knowledge of open source technology is actually uh, not a lot in the market. So in fact, we actually switch uh, legal counsel multiple times uh, during this journey. Uh, and by the way, there's a difference between us understanding um, open source, but there's also a difference between doing that versus building an open source program for a large organization. Uh, what get into some funky situation is that you think that I can get coverage for a license. Most of the time, what we actually find out is that the use case and the license combination is what gets tricky because same license, different use cases, the result could be different. And I'll talk about it in the next slide. So, and I already talked about, we want to avoid building a huge team uh, to support the process. So we can always go through individual approval, but we also want to balance the need to, do we need to build a huge team or do we want a lengthy process or do we want something to scale as much as possible? All right. 
So what do we do? <coughs> so first thing we do is that uh, we work up with both our internal console and outside console. We build an ingestion matrix. So what does it mean here is that we focus on most of the key consumption scenarios. So our principal engineer organization uh, basically summarized those eight key consumption scenario, and we also look at top 11 licenses, which give us maybe three years ago about 88% of um, like all open source usage. So we build a matrix on what are things that we care. So if you look at that, is that uh, we only care about the things in red and in yellow. Everything in green, we do not need an explicit written approval. We still need individuals who adopt the technology to record that for tracking purposes. And obviously, we need to understand about things like versioning and stuff like that because um, different versions of the same open source software may have different licenses. Okay, So um, we handle manual approval for everything else. So if you just look at the coloring of a diagram without reading the text, what do you see? You see a lot of greens. So surprisingly, most of our ingestion scenarios are green. It means that we want our engineers, our development community, our architecture community, not to go through an explicit approval process. So we make it easy for them to ingest software. So uh, one thing that uh, we find out is that a lot of the native mobile application create a lot more red scenario. Because the moment you become a native app, you are in distributing software mode. So licenses are a lot less forgiving when you are distributing software, again, instead of, let's say, hosting something in your server. So that's something, if you look at the previous slide, a lot of red is because of native mobile scenario. OK, uh, dependency management is fun. right? The moment you get into large-scale JavaScript application, like your NPM have like 300 dependencies. So the moment you need to keep tracking dependency, uh, you get into a lot of trouble, So or complexity. Um, what we also find out is that your program need to handle a lot more than just downloading. Downloading software from GitHub or from the internet is only one way to ingest open source software. So we end up building different process flow for all the exceptions. For example, um, if I need to purchase an off-the-shelf off software, most of the time you will have some open source aspect to that. Uh, or if one of our vendors do a custom application for us and use open source software, we need them to disclose that and make it part of our process uh, so that we can record that because we are purchasing the software. So we have different scenarios. We end up building a bunch of process flow to handle all these exceptions. Uh, what is interesting uh, for us as a learning experience is that we switch our legal perspective from use uh, basically asking our vendors to take on all the risk of open source into a mode where we want to share the risk with our vendors. So um, we have a legal policy. Are we happy at that time? Not really. And you're like, why? You have the policy, right? So if the lawyers say yes, everything should be good. But uh, it leads to the next problem, which is if everything is easy to approve, we need to start managing technology footprint, right? So we almost need to balance between the ivory tower of approving nothing into a you're automatically approving everything and that your technology footprint become a mess. So what we do is that we build something called the technology formulary. Uh, a formulary is a pretty much a pharmacy term, by the way, but what we do is that we build a technology standard agreed and maintained by the people doing the work. So that is the important thing. Uh, we do not explicitly say enterprise architecture create a lot, a bunch of standards, and the development team need to follow these standards, even though most of the time the architect haven't touched the software at all, right? They read the, the favorite report or they talk to their favorite uh, consulting vendors. Uh, we want any technology standard to be agreed and maintained by the engineering community. Uh, it is very context use case and versions driven, right? So what we don't want to get into is that if this software is approved, then our developer will find the worst way to use the software. So lesson learned. So we're like, OK, no. Instead, we say, under these type of use case, these type of scenario, use this software. The version be become important for a few reasons. One, there are situations that like different version of the same software 
potentially is a rewrite, it's a rewrite right? So anyone who have built Angular app uh, have went through the same thing, right? Um, and we focus a lot on what we call hands-on opinion. We don't put things into the formula until some of our engineers have actually touched the software. They may not need to read the code, they should, by the way, but uh, we don't want anything into our formula until somebody has said, yes, I have built a POC, it works, it works like that. And the important thing, finally, is that architecture lead the process, but they frustrate the decisions. The decisions are made by the folks doing the work. Uh, so this is how I describe community federated, federated management, right? So uh, this life cycle should be fairly standard for most of you, right? So you're a brand new technology, and you get into a couple of POC, do some experiment, then you get into a restricted mode where, you know what, you can do it for like this and this, but not everything. Then you get into something like, you know what, this is a common standard, everyone please do it. And then at the end, uh, the software may get into containment. Uh, we built a community-driven life cycle to handle that. So to move from new tech to experimental, you need at least one principal engineer to sponsor it. If you want to move into the restrictor, you need more. And then if you want it to become a company recommended software for this particular use case and scenario, you need a community to agree to that. Right? Um, what is also important uh, for us is that if you want to put something in a recommended mode, then it either be a new capability that is not being handled before, or you are required as a community to put certain things in a legacy into sunset mode. Otherwise, we'll get into a, hey, we ingest everything uh, and sunset nothing. So the discipline of if you ingest something, then you need to have the discipline to sunset things. That's very important for us. And then once you put certain things into containment, what we also do is that uh, we need the community to provide our engineers a migration route out of it. Now, uh, that's a catch, obviously. If you say certain uh, software or certain solution become tech debt, uh, and then you need to migrate out of it, then you go back into a prioritization exercise. So that's a catch, right? Things that are not the right thing to do doesn't mean that you can replace it immediately. Uh, because uh, we are still competing in a way between business priorities and technology innovation. So, uh, but that's how we handle the balance between we want to be as loose as possible in terms of uh, encouraging innovation, but we still want a community-driven approach to contain or to create the list of things for people to use. Okay, uh, lesson learned from here is uh, how many of you have, let's say, a large group of directors, senior director level engineer, very senior uh, unicorns, how many, how many organization? Uh, so, sir, how, how, many, how many of those engineers do you have? 50. Uh, have you tried to have these 50 folks in a phone call or in a room and ask them to agree on something? Yeah, and when that happens, how often do they actually agree? Very cool. So uh, very similarly, right? Uh, because we want a group of our top engineers and we promote them based on their thought leadership and their strong opinionated about technology, guess what? You get like 40 of them in a room and say, hey, let's agree on this technology formulary for this particular type of use case. It's hard. But if we don't do that, by the way, you have to bite the bullet. If you don't do that, then none of them will skin the game. The goal is that we want our top engineers to do the governance for architecture so that they will agree on the list of standards, they help drive the open source policy, they drive the adoption, and then they help us in a way work with the engineers day to day because we are not going to be like work with the engineers like every single day. So we rely on the principal engineers to do that. So, Yes, it is difficult for them to agree as a community because you do not get into a very senior level engineer without being a strong opinionated person, most of them at least. Uh, but once you get them to agree, then you get skin in the game for this process. All right, so you may say, wait a second. Uh, not every single company have a large group of technology community. So 
we actually need to build it. Uh, so when the same time we start our transformation and start our open source program, we also start what we call a career ladder program. Uh, so we have executive sponsorship to help promote, mentor, and hire um, principal and distinguished being director and senior director level engineers for Express Scripts. So what we found out is that initially when we start all the program, we're like, oh, we have like three to five, like that level of engineers to start with, it won't work, it won't scale. So we purposely say, hey, uh, senior executive, we need to grow that community so that we can increase our agility and innovation. So for all, these, all the stuff I talk about to work, you need to have a strong technology community. And we purposely grow that community so that they will drive and manage like almost all the ingestion, maintenance, and governance, right? So architecture's role is to help ma manage the process, manage the playbook, but the actual execution are in the technology community. Again, the prerequisite is that you need to build a community. Um, it takes time. Um, when we start the career level program three years ago, we have about five engineers, uh, and over time, three and a half years later, we have almost 40. So some of them we promote, uh, and some of them we hire from external companies. Uh, we also have an explicit mentorship program uh, for some of our senior engineers so that they can grow into the next level. Uh, what we find out a lot of times is that there is a, there's, a, there's an interesting fine line between like, doing your job very well and executing at the next level. So we provide a lot of our engineers mentorship to help them understand what does it mean to get to the next level. And again, it takes time to grow the community. You can't just like, hey, you know what, tomorrow I'm gonna hire 40 people, I have like 40 racks out there. It doesn't work. The other thing that's important is that whoever gets promoted or hire need time to earn and gain respect from the engineering team. So that there are a lot of these that takes time to do because Trust and respect takes time to build within the broader community as well. Okay, I have like two and a half minutes left. Uh, if you look at a quick recap of what, what I just talked about, um, if you look at what are the pillars of our open source ingestion program, so we start with the legal side of things because we want to streamline a lot of that as much as possible. Then we move into a balance between the ivory tower and almost the wild, wild west of technology footprint. So we built a technology formulary uh, to help contain that. But at the end, if you need uh, the program to scale, the governance and the management have to be federated. So the key thing is that you can't have, let's say, a architecture team of five people that make all the decisions for the company. Right? You need to defer and federate those decisions to the larger community, but it takes time to grow the community, and the community need to also gain the respect for the folks they work with day to day. So, that's it for me. I have a minute and a half. Any questions for me? Hopefully it's useful for everybody. And this light is like killing me, by the way. Like, I'm blind. Is it clear or is it confusing? Thank you.